old but not of the world. This has been a big question about the church. How can you be in the world and not be of the world? So now this, the answers are in varying degrees. But it revolves around this question. Can I be in the world and not be of the world? This is a question that I hope our discussions today will center on. So although this paper talks about the contribution of the church national development, we will touch about issues of leadership and how leadership can effectively mobilize the church towards national development. But we begin by asking fundamental questions. What is the state and position of the church on national development? What does the church think about national development? This is a question you bear in mind. Can the church be located in the context of practical, holistic, and economic development? Why not? Practical, complete, and holistic. What is the role of church leadership in socio-political and national development? Yes. And then, what are the challenges inherent in the role of the church to deliver national development? There are challenges that are inherent, and we cannot pretend about them. So, Partly, why we are talking to ourselves today is to tell ourselves the truth. To say, look, even though we want to do some things, but there are things that are working against us. And if we, only we can overcome those things, we may now begin to work effectively as a body. I assume that that's the main reason why we are talking about national development. So, what then is national development? We have to understand development from the context from economic development context and then we now come back to what national development is generally development was seen as the capacity of a national economy in other words if you are comparing development indices you look at what is the capacity of an american economy what is the capacity of nigeria's economy what is the capacity? In that regard, South Africa is more developed than Nigeria because of volume of economy, even though South Africa is a smaller country in terms of population. If you do that comparison, you will say that South Africa is more developed than Nigeria. But then the grounds were shifted to say, look, if a nation had been stagnated for years and there has been no appreciable growth, then suddenly that nation witnesses between 5 to 7% growth in GDP that nation should be said to have developed. Well, these are economic theories anyway. If you like, don't bother too much about this. And everything around you looks like you are from America, you are developing. <laughs> I watch Nigerian comedy movies, and they talk about uh, accent. You say, many people during Christmas, you hear people talk like Americans or, or British people because they actually come for holiday. So to them, they see the westernization as development. If you do anything that looks like you are from Kagoro, they will say you are a bushman. <laughs> so, you have westernization. But the arrogant celebration of westernization was soon to be challenged. If you equate development to industrialization or to growth in per capita income, how come that even among those economies that you have this growth, people are poor, people are wretched. So what's happening? There must be a problem. And so, the totality of the human capital development, comprising economic development, health issues, welfare issues, good governance, equity, is the totality that is taken together as development. And this is the new concept of development. So we need to bear this at the back of our minds as we talk about development. So is economic development, national development? No. So we move to national development. National development, when you have witnessed a profound change in all these indices holistically as they affect the entire nation, then a nation is said to be developing nationally many questions will arise from this in nigeria we say oh the telecom sector has evolved over time you, any, anybody talking about development they say ah, it's telecom sector recently i was talking with my son i said 
supposing something happens to South Africa tomorrow and they decide to withdraw MTN, what shall we do? We'll be dead completely. How come that as a nation, we have not felt that we should deliberately program some business people to take on the development of mobile telecoms in Nigeria? How come, if we really think as a nation, what are the national institutions that we have on the ground? Very few. If you look at ICPC, EFCC, all right, they are, they are nation-building agencies. But beyond them, we do not have agencies that promote nationhood. So nationhood is a question for us to answer in Nigeria. And as long as we have not answered that question, we cannot be talking of national development. There would be sectorial development, there would be piecemeal development, but it cannot be national development. There is a kind of cohesion that is required for a nation, a nation to experience national development. And this cohesion is still lacking in Nigeria today. So as we convoke here this morning, we are asking ourselves, has the effort made by Pastor Delvan yielded any tangible results? The trips to the south and the trip to the west, have they breached the divisions that are consuming us as a nation? And this is serious, something that we... Do we still have poverty? Do we still have unemployment? And unemployment is very serious. Let me tell you, it's not in the number of people that are unemployed that unemployment is a serious problem. It is the inability to access the employment. You see, it's beyond... And I want you for a second to understand what I'm trying to say. We can say out of 10 graduates, only 2 graduates are employed now. So this one we can understand. But there is a bigger problem. Not everybody can even access the employment. Deliberately so. So we are sitting on a more serious problem. And until that bridge is broken, if you are discussing indices of unemployment, you, you know yourself that you don't even have the correct indices for unemployment. There is make-believe unemployment. There is artificially created unemployment, depending on your characteristics and depending on who you are. I'm sure God will give you the understanding of what I'm trying to say. So if development encompasses all of this, then we have to look at what can bring about this holistic development and what role can the church play? Can the church go back to being the provider for the poor people? Can the church go back? Is it not sufficient if you are able to cater for the less privileged people? Can you imagine the amount of mobilization that you can have, the influence you can have on them? If the church will reflect on this, something good will happen. So we come to the church as a body and its potentials for development. Many men of God will tell you, the church is the body of believers. That's what scripture says. The body of those who profess Christianity. The death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The moment you profess that, you enter into the body of the church. So this is one level of the church. But there is a physical church. And I want you, maybe you have not thought of it. You see, the physical church and the spiritual church are not the same. But for a Christian, they are the same. I'll explain to you. You were in the early church. The church knew that there were physical issues to cater for. Poverty, feeding, widows. So they said, let us separate for us men. What kind of men? Filled with the Holy Spirit. You now see what I'm saying. To take care of these physical aspects that are also very serious to the church. Very serious. It's not that they are insignificant. But those men and women, that will be their preoccupation. But you know what? Stephen took charge of that committee or subcommittee. In the final analysis, Stephen t 
turned out to be one of the biggest spiritual leaders in the history of Christianity. What else can it be for you to sacrifice your life before the body of Christ? So although he had a leading role in the physical church, he was indeed a spirit being. So I want us to understand this distinction so that when we come to talk about leadership, you will see what, what the differences between the two. Now, the church is seen as a mystery and sacrament of salvation. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. This is what the, the scripture says about... But I think that beyond this, what is the church doing? How do we see the church? One, the church is seen as an organ of social justice and humanitarian service. Social justice and humanitarian service. What role is the church playing? The church has left this role to NGOs, non-governmental organizations. It is very good to play that role. But the NGOs are not coming from the background of the church. They are doing something to satisfy natural instincts. All right, you see, it's a classic thing to say that you have an NGO that is taking care of the less privileged. Meanwhile, you, have, you don't know anything about the salvation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You don't know anything about it. But you run an NGO that goes to prisons and gives people faded clothes to take care of them. So the church is actually the one that should drive this process of taking care of the less privileged and not the NGOs that do not know exactly what should be the spirit behind all this. Some churches have done very well, I have to say this. If you look at the Catholic Church, for example, they have the Justice Department and Peace Commission from time to time. They tend to issue statements to control what their members will do. Some churches have done that. Some Pentecostal churches have also done that. I've seen them getting involved with being, pr promoting social justice and humanitarian service. Some people have done it individually as Christians. I've met a few people who used their offices to promote social justice. And I, I, I must thank them. I cannot talk about, about them openly. Some of them highly placed. They, they, we had interfaced on a number of things with them. And I saw that even though they could not come out publicly, but somehow they used their positions to rescue people that were being harassed, people that were being punished for nothing that they had done. So I think that not just as a body of Christ, but as an individual, it should also be our responsibility to preserve social justice. The church from time to time will set criteria of the conduct for its people. Next, the church has a prophetic role. The church, through its prophecy, confronts sin. Elijah did that. He went to hell and said, look, to hell with you. That's not what he said anyway. <laughs> if you like, go and what you are about to do is wrong. As a proof, go and bring all your prophets if you think you are anything. The church... The first prophetic role is to confront sin. If you want national development, if the individuals have purged themselves of sin, they can easily have a way of developing or bringing about development. But what is prophecy now? Is prophecy for sale? Is prophecy not targeted? Why is it that we are interested in end-of-year prophecy for what will happen to Good Luck Jonathan? What will happen to Buhari? You can do that, but honestly... I don't think that's what we should be doing. The prophet should be more serious than this. If a prophet identifies that there's an issue somewhere, the prophet must go and tell that there's an issue somewhere. If you cannot do this, we cannot bring about development. We cannot be, be fraternizing and masquerading and then and in the name of giving prophecies. We say that so there will be a problem. We have a potent tool. You know, recently, some experience that I've been having. There are men of God we pray with from time to time. And what God has been ministering to me is that in every word that is spoken, in every prophecy that is spoken, 
It could be a bad word that is spoken, but believe me, it is what you hear that matters to you. If, if what you see is good, it good will happen to you. So you have to be very careful. The church, prophets have a very important tool. They can change a lot of things, and the church can do this. The church is a peacemaker. The church should play the role of a peacemaker. There is no peace in Nigeria. What role can the church play? You cannot have development without peace. Are you initiating any moves that can bring about peace? In the war ravage, in the bandit ravage communities of our southern Kaduna or northern Kaduna, is there anything the church is doing to bring healing and to bring succor? Without peace, there can be no development. The church is the moral compass of the society. The church sets the direction of morality. Has the church been able to play this role? Many questions surrounding the church are moral compass. Yes, the leaders are a mesh in so many things. Financial scandals, issues of divorce, issues of um, um, moral issues. And yet, and yet, this is not what the church should do if the church wants to bring leadership and development. The church is the moral compass of the society. If you are not standing well, you cannot be a compass to anybody. It's bad. We don't want to talk about it. I warned you before. I said the reason why we are here is to say, look, God, with humble hearts, we may not have been doing what we are supposed to do. But we want to move forward. We want to be the ones guiding. So that's what we want to do. Is the church a moral compass? This is it. The church is the provider of Western education. I've already underscored this. Some of the best schools now are provided by the church. Even at tertiary level, at least where I function, I know. Covenant University is one of the best universities we know. It's rated highly all over. Babcock University, Redeemers University, Bingham University, Veritas University, Caritas University. The list is endless. But let me tell you, for the same reasons, the church is being persecuted. I'm not going to talk about that now. It's a discussion for another day. But have in mind that the church has a big potential and is providing education. The church must walk, must open its eyes to see what this potential is. The church is an economic hope. Economic hope. The church can create. If I, 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 at least I just cite the examples that are near me. If you go to Goshen, you know where, if you know where Bingham University is located, you see the next place to us is Goshen. Everything there, the bread, the water, the juice, is all made by living faith. You buy and sell and consume it there. A lot of money circulating amongst its members. Their bread does not last for one day. What is the church doing? What is the church doing to build up its economy? Equa is another very excellent example. When I went to Bingham University, we were heavily indebted. And we were almost dead. I must say, Ambassador Bajoga can bear me witness. One company established by Equa was able to pay a debt of 5 billion naira to rescue us out while we are at the same time remitting the money to that company. This is the church. It's not magic. The church is an economic hope. There's no question at all about it. If you are removing economy from the church, you are not going to get development in any way. For reasons I've already said, the church is the conscience of the nation. When did the church speak about wrongs in the society? We just ended SARS. It's only a few churches that mobilized their people and marched on, on the streets and said, no, there is injustice that must be addressed. Why was it not the entire body of Christ that did this? Why was it not? So you allow a few people to do that, then they will be arrested. And then the followers will withdraw back and say, well, Munga is this is what we are suffering from. So we come to the role of church leadership in development. Again, the logical question is, what is leadership? Leadership, see, is a more serious matter than what people think. And let me start by a disclaimer. Not everybody is offering leadership. I mean, let's be clear about that. And there are many definitions 
of what leadership is. But one of the definitions that strikes me is that given by Mullins. He said, leadership is a process through which an individual over time and in a given context influences his followers to begin to act in a particular way on their own towards achieving certain goals and objectives. This to me is the most classic definition of leadership. In other words, you are not going to force anybody. You are not going to coerce anybody. But through your character, through your traits, through your skills, you, you have influenced people so much that they will begin to act. And this clearly we see this in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ influenced his disciples in such a way that people saw the way they were acting and they said, ah, these guys must be Christians. So leadership is about influence. And what it means is you could actually have a negative influence just as you could have a positive influence. Yeah, a lot of the young people, when you talk about leadership, what they want is to copy the effervescent things about individuals. Those things that evaporate. The way he dresses, that's the way I want to dress. The way he talks, he said, let's open to Matthew chapter number 30 verse this. That's the way I want to talk. And you see that as a way of copying leadership. My brother, my sister, the thing is beyond that. It's beyond that. Leadership is also closely related to management and administration. I dare to say, at least to be in the classroom for two minutes. Management concerns itself with doing things using others the right way. Now, administration is getting an entire system to work, putting together leaders and managers such that an entire system can work. That's what administration is all about. But this is for another day. Back to leadership. So, it's possible to have a bad leader who has influenced his people negatively. Just like it's possible to have a good leader positively who has influenced his people. What kind of leader am I? Sometimes I wonder how many people are looking up to me. And honestly, it gives me sleepless nights. Because when I have done something wrong, I know I'm not supposed to do. What comes to my mind is that how many people will copy what I've done? And it's, it's, I find it, it's, it's a big... So you must ask yourself, what influence are you exerting in the church? That's where we are starting because that's the pedestal we are trying to develop before we now launch into the nation. The leaders are often said to concern themselves with spiritual matters. I don't mean uh, Bible matters, no. The spirit behind an issue. So in which case, they are concerned with the right steps that you will take far ahead of time so that you will arrive at your destination. But managers are looking at the immediate. Is this right? If you come to this compound today, oh, who is supposed to sweep that place? They, they didn't sweep it. Or who is supposed to put on the electricity? They didn't put it. Or who is supposed to own these fans? Have they checked the music instruments? Are they okay? They are managers. But this ministry, in the next 20 years, do we want to reach out to only orphans or widows? They are leaders. In the next five years, how many youths do we want to put on the entrepreneurial path so that they can develop themselves? They are leaders. The church must provide leadership, managers, and even administrators. It's the church that has the best administration. The church has had its own opportunities. We cannot pretend about it. Many Christians have been appointed into positions. We have. I mean, that's the truth. But the question is, have we influenced people in using those positions in such a way that the church can benefit? Silently, you ask yourself, how many people have you brought up? I say this with tears, I'm, I'm, and I mean it, I'm not joking. Years back, about 30 years ago, and I'm not saying this with pride, somebody called me and said, look, my friend, I know that you can do your work very well, but I know that you don't have money. I'm told that you don't have money. Is it true? I said, yes, I don't have money. This was 1990. He said, 
Have you seen one million naira? I said, how can somebody from Kagoro see one million naira? We have not seen that kind of money back home. He said, okay. Sit down. I sat down. He called his manager. He said, uh, I don't want to call the name. He said, Guadebe, come. That's the name of the manager. He came. He said, come with account opening papers. He came. It's like Nigeria movie. Oh. This one I'm telling you. I sat down here. So he said, open one million naira account for this man. This was 1990. He opened an account in my name with one million naira. Then he said, do you know why I'm doing this? I said, no. He said, in 1976, the Kano State government gave me a contract, him now, not me, of one million naira. And I stole the money. I did not do the contract. Instead, I established myself big companies. You know I'm a rich man? I say, yes, you are a rich man. But in my mind, I will say you are a thief. <laughs> he said, you know I'm a rich man? He said, Tom, I am giving you this one million naira to start your business so that from today, this one million that I stole, I have now refunded it. And make sure you don't steal anybody's money. I'm being honest to you. This is 30 years ago. So you can imagine for yourself what has happened along the line. So anytime I ask myself, how many people have I brought like this and say, look, take 250,000, go and start business. How many people have I done that to? If I really want development and the people around my house are not developed, the people in my local church are not developed, can I claim to have any power at all? What kind of development am I looking for? If I have not influenced three, four, five youths after this experience, then it means something is wrong with me. Whether something is wrong with me or not, only me can answer that anyway. A leader must have a vision, so I have to jump. Now, leadership in politics is a little bit more complex if you apply this definition. To have the ability to influence people with diverse persuasions, diverse viewpoints, you know that it's tougher. In the church, you are likely to easily influence people. But here outside, there are people whose persuasions are totally different. But a good leader should still be able to surmount this and reach out to have an influence so that people will say, Kai, this man is a good man. And let me tell you, it's very possible. It's very, very possible. The people you think are not interested in good leadership, they even like good leadership more than you. So if they see an honest person, somebody of integrity, they would always come back to you to refer to you for what you are supposed to do. They will always. But if you are working without integrity and people cannot vouch for you, nobody will come to you and say, this is what I want you to do for me. So fundamentally, the Christian must work towards uniting people with different persuasions. Democracy is a very interesting attribute. You know, a lot of people say government of the people for the people and by the people. Uh, this is uh, uh, Lincoln, a famous pronounce, pronouncement. Actually, it's a borrowed terminology. It used to be the Bible for the people and for everyone. Lincoln just extracted it and for the first time made a pronouncement and people now started saying democracy. But actually, democracy simply meant the Bible then. That is, everything written in the Bible as the rules for everyone is what people should be following. So, but now we are talking about democracy. So please, if you are entering the arena of democracy, open your eyes and know that leadership will behove on you to try to influence people in such a way that they see. You know, I mean, of course, they are not going to be Christians. There will be people who are not Christians. So you are not saying that they must come to now be Christians. No. But let them see there are right things that you think a society should see. Because those ones, in my own opinion, will not depend on whether you are a Christian or not a Christian. Development can be brought about by anyone. This is clearly scriptural anyway, so I know this is a topic for another day. So I have outlined here approaches to leadership. This is why I'm not going to go into that. Traits. What are people looking for? What are behavioral tendencies? But now there's a new thinking. That is, if you want to understand a leader, do not just see his actions. Try to understand what is responsible for his actions. And if you do that, 
you are likely to understand the leader. This, so if you see someone behaving in a particular way and you say, oh no, I like his style of leadership or I don't like, why is he succeeding with this style of leadership? Are you likely to succeed by simply giving the, the answer? Maybe no. Because we started by saying leadership has to do with context and time. So a leader in the church may not be a good leader in the church, in the school. Clear? A leader who is good in the school may have nothing to offer in the church because there's a context there. So you do not wake up and say, because this man, we've seen that he has, his, he has good attributes. So let's make him a leader of our Bible study group. He doesn't follow. The grace of God has to be on him. Or you are setting up your little business and you say, Kai, this man is very calm and gentle. Please come and be the managing director. He may fail you because it's beyond that. It combines so many things. Soft skills, hard skills, and attributes. They all must combine together to give a leader or a round figure. So if you have someone who speaks softly and you think that if you make him the manager of your company, the company will succeed. You still have a long way to go. Check his other things. Does he have ability to negotiate? Is he a calm-spirited person? Does he have any skills to offer? Is he computer literate? Does he understand systems? What about critical thinking? What about decision making? Does he have these attributes? If he doesn't have them, you will put together, you have no business making him a leader. So that we will take the right steps. We have to look at all of this put together. So who is the church leader? Good. This one is clear. Here I've made a distinction. And again, we have to be patient to understand this. I've said that there are leaders among the church and then there are leaders in the church. Now, in the church means your pastor here, your head of Bible studies, your music director. To me, they are in the church. Among the church means there are Christian leaders outside in their organizations, but they cannot remove themselves from being Christians. So they are leaders and they can only offer what the viewpoints, Christianity, the attributes, and the grace God has helped them. They must bring this to play. So they are among the church. But the ones that are inside the church, and both of them are okay. They are leadership. So what is Christian leadership? A leader in the church, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 2, he must be above reproach. Above reproach. I'm sure that many men of God will tell you. But so many men of God are not above reproach. And they are seen as leaders. So how then will leadership stand? I see the problem. Here, it's not our business to judge anybody. But when they say above reproach, it means above reproach. There's nothing anybody can do about that. So if a, a man is not above reproach, if the man is not a husband of one wife, he cannot be a leader, period. <laughs> That's just what the scripture says. It's not me now. So, and, and you see, we must, a man must be hospitable. He must have his house under control. Then he comes here and says, he is a leader in the church, but his son is into drugs, his wife has left, this one has done that. You have a problem in your hands. It's not leadership. So, and if you are standing on that crutch, there's no way you can dispense leadership. Whether people like it or not, I've told you before that we are saying to God, this may not be what we have been doing, but we now want to start doing it. I'm sure that's the reason why we are here. Anyway, I assume so. So, a leader among the church, that's what brings in Khan and the other. You know, Khan has various blocks. The Orthodox, the Pentecostal, and now is where I see the relevance of the nation tour by Pastor Dalvan. If that will succeed in getting people to know, look, gentlemen, you may be Catholic, you may be Presbyterian, you may be Pentecostal. We have an irreducible minimum, our profession of Christ. Let us now come together and remove the arrogant barriers that have separated us. Let us move with one voice. Let us identify the potential in the church. Let us now say, you church members that are occupying this position, from time to time, come and give us a report of what you have done in your own place. We will see whether we are progressing or not. 
So Khan should be supported. Khan should be supported to do well. The nation's tour that Pastor Dalvan began, my own frank recommendation is that reach out to those places. Paul did a first missionary journey, a second missionary journey. You may need a second missionary journey for this. But reach out to people and see who knows. It may be the foundation of the unity that we are looking for. And once we can get that unity, a lot of things will happen to us. So here again, I jump so many things um, to the challenge of church leadership and national development. So what is this? What are the things that are stopping us from acting? One is religious pride. I call it I pass my neighbor syndrome. My auditorium is the biggest auditorium. My papa, the suit he wears to the church is about $1,000. To be honest to you, I was extremely disappointed. I saw one man of God I hold in high respect. He came to the church and was said, look, this suit you see me wear is not like those ones I've been wearing before. Those ones I've been wearing, one of them, I bought them 1,000 pounds. And this one is not up to that, but people don't know the difference.